Greetings, this is Jared Love, and in this video, which will be a part one of a two-part series, I'm going to be going over Stretch IK and how to set it up in a robust and also very clean setup. So for the first video, I'm going to go over just what the end result is going to look like, as well as just a, a few things for the way we want to actually set up the IK and Stretchy aspect of it so that it will be a, a nice stable deformation. And so just to start off with, this is just a very simple IK chain. Um, this would be like a wrist control or an ankle control. Then you've got a pull vector control, which would be like the elbow or knee. And I just threw a control here just for the start of the chain. Um, it would be as if you had a clavicle or the hips or something controlling that. So one of the things this has is this stretchy attribute that you can turn on and off to blend whether or not it will stretch. And as you see, when we get to a certain point, it starts actually bending the elbow, um, which I'll describe a little bit more later, but that's something important you want. So the stretching only happens once the length of the uh, the distance from the start to your wrist control reaches the point where it's at the default full length of the combined distance from the upper and lower arm segments. Um, the other thing uh, I've got in this, or another thing I've got in this, is this lock attribute. So you can actually lock the elbow or knee to your pull vector control so that you can move this around and it's going to basically lock it to that position. Now in this, the IK is still working. You'll see when I move this up and down how that uh, shoulder joint still rotates. So it is keeping the IK chain in this single plane of uh, activity and making sure that it's still pointing towards this pole vector control. Just it has the added benefit of essentially pinning that elbow to the pole vector control. So, and then the other thing that I've added in this is this nudge attribute. And what it does is it basically lengthens or shrinks the joints so that you can affect where that knee is. And the reason I put this in here was to help with popping. So there's there's two kinds of popping that will happen with IK. You've got just the natural kind of snap that happens when the joint chain gets too long. It will it, it has trouble evaluating the the math so that if your if your angle gets too obtuse it will just snap it so when it's in this kind of position you can use the nudge to kind of pop it out just a little bit more uh, if you need to and if you go in the negative you'll see the joint start to shrink uh, again because effect effectively what I'm doing is I'm changing the length of the joints with this now the other kind of popping that you can run into is if uh, like say in your, say this is a leg and you have a foot roll system. So as you roll that foot up, it's going to affect the ankle, but it's also going to affect the knee. So depending on how your keys work out, you may have a key that looks like this. And then um, in the next frame, the, the knee has popped out like this far or something. So what you can do is you can use this nudge attribute to kind of help soften that popping uh, within your animation to help smooth out the transition of the knee. Okay, so let's just zero this all back out. Um, okay, so if if you're if you're already aware of stuff like using translates instead of scales or um, using distance between nodes, then you can go ahead and probably skip the rest of this video and head on to the next one where I start going over the stretchy IK setup. But uh, I just want to use this to kind of illustrate a couple of things that we're going to be doing. So this is a really simple, just two joint setup. 
with a cylinder that has rounded end caps on it. And the cylinder is bound to these two joints where all of these control points on the cylinder are bound 100% to this joint. All of these control points are bound 100% to this joint. And then these points right here in the middle are 50-50 between the two. So if you imagine this as being like your leg and you do a stretchy setup where you're actually connecting into the scale, as you scale the joint, you'll notice that the deformation on your geometry is a little unstable. And by that, what I mean is, like, for example, this span right here should be halfway between your two joints, but it definitely has a, a bias towards the, the main joint. So as it stretches down, it, it goes further this way. As it expands out, it goes further that way instead of staying halfway in between. The other issue you see is that these points here stretch out as well. So you would probably never get to a point where you're, you're shrinking like this, but as you stretch out, what would happen is any uh, points, say on your shoulder or your hip or wherever you know the top of this IK chain is, any points that go beyond the top of the joint are going to have this stretching happen to them, and it's going to cause a little bit of, you know, crimping and, and just uh, kind of not very clean looking deformation. So part of what's causing this, if we look at the joints themselves, um, you see we've got this uh, scale to inverse scale connection. And that's something that Maya does to, to help out. So if we just delete this connection and take a look again, and we scale it, we'll notice that that these guys right here in the middle are now staying 50% between. They're, that's pretty nice and clean. But when you look at it, also there's stretching over here and stretching here still, which the stretching down here will actually could probably cause more harm to other joints and things stretching and going out of whack than necessarily just the geometry, but it will affect the geometry too, of course. So if we undo that, okay, so now we've got that back. Uh, rather than doing that, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to translate this joint. So you see this lower joint, when we translate it and change its translation value, this is a much more stable deformation. You see that the end here doesn't stretch, the end here doesn't stretch, and this guy in the middle is 100% in the middle. He's just staying right there. And that's what we want. Now keep in mind, this isn't taking into consideration volume preservation, where this would kind of shrink in and, and you'd have like a kind of more of an hourglass type uh, shape happening with it. Uh, I'm just talking about the length of the stretch. You would you would handle that volume preservation a different way. So hopefully that gives you a good enough idea of why we would want to go with translates instead of scales for for setting up the actual IK stretchy aspect. Now something else I want to talk about is in a lot of tutorials I've seen. Um, they will use this create measure tool distance tool. So they'll create these two guys and they'll use this for uh, setting up the, the measurement between um, your start point and your end, uh, which would be like your control. And, you know, obviously that that's doable. It's, it works and it's not going to uh, cause any problems uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, the issue I have with it is that it's actually a little bit wasteful. So if we look at it, we've got three transform nodes, one for each locator and one for the actual distance dimension node. And then if we turn on shapes here, you'll see we actually also have three shape nodes. So the locator shapes and the dimension shape. So if we, let's just take these, Let's clear this and graph it. Um, so 
you see we've got uh, the, the locator shapes pumping into the dimension shape. So actually your transform nodes are kind of useless. They're not really doing anything. Uh, they go into the, sorry, we have the world position for each going into the start and end point. And then the distance coming out here. So we've got a value of uh, 7.5 something. So there's another node that basically does the same thing but much less expensively so the distance between node is what we're gonna look at and let me pull these over here so I guess we have to show all uh, so with this if I was to plug in this world position into the point one and point two uh, that would be doing the same kind of thing as here. But if you notice, there's also this pair of matrix plugs as well. So what we can do is we can plug in the world matrix of these locator transforms. And it doesn't have to be a locator. It can be any transform. It could be a joint or just an empty transform, which most of the time I'm using empty transforms. But anyway, so you see... These are the two locators uh, that are the parents of these two shape nodes for the distance dimension. So the distance between, if we look at that, the actual distance we get out of that is 7.5 something, which again is the same as that one. So you can see this being a lot cleaner um, if, if you uh, say you had like in, in the case that we'll be doing, we will have a distance calculation from the start to the end. We will also have one from the uh, shoulder to the elbow pull vector control. We'll have one from the elbow pull, ve pull vector control to the wrist control as well. So we'll have three distance dimensions that we would be making, which would be, you know, nine nodes versus... Um, we already have the transforms there because of the controls. So if we have the controls there already and we're just going to use three distance dimension nodes and plug in the matrices of those um, controls that already exist, we're using three nodes instead of nine. Uh, so it's a lot cleaner. And, you know, I guess you could argue that you could... Um, create a couple of distance dimension shapes and then you could plug the locators in um, like re reconnect so that you've got uh, say this this would be like the elbow and you plug this into the other uh, another one of your dis distance dimension shape nodes but really go with this guy because he's a lot better okay um, the one last thing I want to talk about is uh, global scaling and I'm going to show you a couple of different methods, but the, the one I'm really going to go with for this one is uh, kind of more bomb-proof and more elegant. So if we look at these, so these, these three are, they all pretty much do the same thing. Um, the, the node network's a little different, but look at this top red one for now, uh, and I'm going to show you the, the scaling issue. So with it, you know, at its default normal uh, scaling, this all works pretty well, and we've got the locking working. Um, so, you know, all great. Um, the issue comes in when you want to uh, globally scale your your rig. So, if you notice, as well, let's let's use an actual. There we go. Uh, if you notice, as I scale it, the elbow starts bending instead of staying straight. Um, and if we take these guys, which both have a global scale built into them, and we scale them, you see they stay straight. They're not actually bending at the elbow. So what's going on here is, if we just take this and parent it here, uh, watch this distance. And also take note of, of these values. So this one's at negative uh, three something and six in the Z. So as we take this and we scale it, you see this, this distance grows, right? 
So this is now about twice what it was. And then if we look at these values here, they're still the same value. So that's kind of what's going on here. The translation value for these joints has not changed. Or, sorry, the default translate value for those joints hasn't changed because their space is scaled up. But the distance that we're calculating between here has grown. So it's telling the system that, hey, these joints need to be scaled up, even though at this point technically they don't, because the distance calculation is not actually taking in any kind of compensation for the scale change that's happened. So that's, I think that's all I'm going to do for this first video. The second video I'll go in, I'll start with this chain and we're going to kind of work our way down to kind of the final goal here at the bottom um, where I'll, I'll show the typical method I've seen used for doing a global scale compensate and I'll also explain how the, uh, the stretching and the locking stuff works. So that'll be it for this video. I hope you find it useful and check out the next video. Thanks and have a blessed day.